Um, my name is Tracy Freck. I'm at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and I've directed our scleroderma center there since 2006. Um, this is um, close to my ninth scleroderma foundation meeting, and I just wanted to welcome everyone and uh, thank the scleroderma foundation for inviting me to come and speak with you all. Um, any disclosures, and what that means is oftentimes people ask lots of questions about therapeutics, and so it's good to know whether uh, a person has pharmaceutical um, funding and so everything I talk about is really my clinical experience so taking care of patients I like to start with what is scleroderma because I think oftentimes reading online or going to different lectures that very basic question can be very confusing and so what defines the diagnosis of scleroderma or systemic sclerosis is the presence of a vasculopathy now anything with Opathy on the end means abnormality, and vasculo refers to blood vessels, so this is a blood vessel abnormality. And the very common symptoms of this blood vessel abnormality, which we'll talk a little bit about, include Raynaud's phenomenon, which you see up here, where the ve blood vessels spasm, and then subsequently there can be a puffy, which um, the medical terminology is a demitus phase, in which the, you move from Raynaud's to a puffy uh, hand. And a lot of folks, this is the earliest presentation of the disease. We believe that vasculopathy precedes the fibrosis. And the terminology fibrosis is a fancy word for scarring. So first a blood vessel abnormality and then scarring. But even that's not completely straightforward because the scarring can have a hard, tight, hidebound phase. And then followed by an atrophic phase, which Dr. York did a very nice job describing in the last lecture, in which the skin, the tissue beneath the skin is, is uh, depressed or goes away. And the skin can then appear a little bit softer and, and burnt out. Vasculopathy, or abnormal blood vessels, and fibrosis scar tissue. The, what causes it and how the body responds to it is unknown. But in scleroderma, we do believe immune dysfunction plays a pivotal role in that is changes to the blood vessels and the scar tissue formation. And the reason we believe that is the presence of antibodies. So your body usually will respond to an infectious insult by making an antibody. So the antibody is in response to an, an insult on the body. In scleroderma, there's blood markers or autoantibodies that suggest that you're attacking self for no good reason. And so the role, uh, when we say systemic sclerosis, in any given individual out there, there can be different amounts of vasculopathy, fibrosis, and immune dysregulation. And so the three components can vary in severity. But all these three components are pivotal to that diagnosis. To make things even more challenging, scleroderma changes over time. And oftentimes, you'll look around the room or you'll meet other patients and you'll think, I have a really different form of this disease than the person I just spoke to, spoke about. And that can reflect where a person is in the disease duration. So here is sort of a famous uh, slide that, um, from Ginny Steen that looks at how skin thickness changes over time. Over, uh, and um, this would be our diffuse cutaneous patients that have skin thickening above the elbows, um, above the knees and on the abdomen versus limited distribution of skin thickening, which is below the knees or below the elbows. And what we can see as we're gonna talk about GI dysfunction, how where you are in your disease can really vary. Early on we see GI dysfunction, but also we see it late in disease. And so consistently, whether you've just been diagnosed or you're late in the disease, GI tract is important and something that we should focus our attention on. So with that introduction, let me talk to you about some just basic facts about the gastrointestinal tract. It is the most common outside of skin, so the word cutaneous means skin, so it's the most common outside of skin organ system involved in scleroderma. I think that makes it pretty important. It presents as the initial symptom in the 10% of our patients, but over the course of the illness, virtually, the textbooks will say 90%. I would say, honestly, 100% of patients will have some type of GI tract complaint. It's associated with lots of sickness and can even be associated with death, so it's really important that we address it in the clinic. 
Much less is known about the GI tract pathophysiology than the skin. And the main reason for that is many of you may have given skin biopsies as part of clinical trials. But routinely in the studies we do, we sort of ignore the GI tract. You may fill out a questionnaire, but we haven't had a really good, well phenotyped, meaning well described gastrointestinal tract sa uh, tissue samples um, available for research. But that's changing and encouraging. We also know that in the tissue studies that, that have been done, long disease duration tended to be focused on as opposed to early disease. And really, patients could have a little bit of GI symptomatology and really severe sim symptomatology, and the tissues were treated the same or equal. So really, when you ask questions, I, this is my disclaimer that I'll say over and over again, we need more research. We need to understand that better before I can give you 100% certainty in my answers. Um, and the other thing, too, is that there's um, considerable practice variation as we approach the diagnosis and empiric, meaning we're going to treat it and see if we get it better before we study it. And so with this background in mind, let's talk about the manifestations of what may be there before we focus on the nutrition and the probiotics part of the talk, which is really what I'm interested in. I think it's important for us to realize when we're talking about the GI tract, we're talking about all the way from the mouth to the anus. And the, the, the problems in scleroderma, in particular with the mouth, can be changes toward the oral aperture. And so as the disease progresses, there can be tightness that forms around the mouth and the decrease in size of the oral aperture. So why that's important is it can affect chewing and it can affect teeth cleaning. And so really the way that we study, best study how the mouth changes is oral measurements and a dental evaluation. And I oftentimes will write a letter if you don't have dental coverage and say this is absolutely a medical indication. And so if you're not able, if you don't have dental, dental coverage, you can get your physician to write a note, and I have not had problems, to say this is a medical condition and teeth need to be cleaned and looked at. For the esophagus, many people are troubled by reflux, and it can vary in severity. Oftentimes, the lower part of the esophagus, when the, the reflux is particularly bad, can get inflamed and that tissue gets red. In medical terminology, itis just means inflammation, so you get inflammation to the esophagus. Usually, the esophagus works like a snake, so if you think of a snake swallowing its prey and it kind of goes down that tube in a well-coordinated contraction, Dysmotility means that that contraction, that where it should be very well coordinated musculature telling your, the food to go down in the esophagus into the stomach, doesn't quite work well. And so those signals don't work, food can get stuck and not move down in a, in a very well coordinated manner. There can also be a stricture that forms. So after lots of reflux, the body's trying to repair that, and scar tissue can actually impede the ability of food to pass down through the esophagus. The symptoms here are really quite vague, and that's really why I say it's important for you to track your symptoms, and we'll talk about that in the next slide set. But heartburn, difficulty swallowing, and food getting stuck are all things that your physician should know about. So if you're not asked these questions, it's really important you record these. And I love when my patients come with questions and, and write down a list of things they want to talk about because they can really focus on things that, that um, are important to them. So if these are things that are bothering you, make sure you bring them up because this is one part of the gastrointestinal tract that we can do a pretty good job of understanding what's going on. And so an endoscopy, and I'll show some pictures of this procedure, can be is, is a, an invasive procedure where a scope is put through the mouth, looks at the esophagus, stomach, and first part of the small bowel. It's a study, though, that oftentimes we delay in scleroderma because we say, well, we know the esophagus is involved. Let's try some empiric treatments first. However, I do point out that if you're having very severe symptoms, regardless of empiric treatment, this is a very well-tolerated, easy five to 10 minute procedure that can be done to try to diagnose and move forward. 24-hour pH study or manometry, I'll also show that procedure. I know this is a lot of words. This is one of those wordy slides. Um, can be done to see if you're being treated for reflux, are we doing a good enough job? So is that reflux that's coming back from the stomach into the esophagus, is it really acidic, which can cause burning or changes to the distal esophagus? Or is it, is it just that you're still having reflux of alkaline or non-acidic reflux that we need to address? Question, please. 
Oh, no. oh. <laughs> I, had, I was like, oh, okay, interactive. <laughs> got so excited. Um, good, thank you. Okay, on the endoscopy, yes. how often should we get one done? I know we should, you know, at least every couple of years. Perfect question. So the guidelines are if you have 10 years of reflux, so you're, you need an endoscopy to look for Barrett's esophagus, which is precancerous um, changes. Any of these symptoms that are getting worse, or if you're on immunosuppression, so pres um, suppression of your immune system, to look for possible infectious etiology. If you've been dilated, that will vary by gastroenterologist. So if you've had a history of a stricture and you've been dilated and those symptoms are coming back, even after six months, a gastroenterologist may say, you know, we should take another look. I didn't balloon dilate maybe as far as I should have. And so it can vary by patient. But the cardinal thing is if you've had reflux for over 10 years and you've never had a scope, it's a good discussion to have with your doctor. And again, it really severity of symptoms. Great question. For stomach, the, the uh, endoscopy also um, will evaluate the stomach. And the most common problems we see in scleroderma are delayed emptying, so the stomach doesn't empty, and this is really bothersome for patients, and we'll talk a little bit about how to manage this with, with some nutrition, because that makes you feel full, and you're not hungry for your next uh, meal. You can develop ulcers, and that's particularly in patients that take anti-inflammatories um, because of joint pain. And then there's a, a problem called gastro, gastric antral vascular ectasias, or GAVE, also known as watermelon stomach. And these are the little telangiectasias that develop on the top part of the stomach that can put someone at risk for bleeding. And this problem um, oftentimes can be so slow in its presentation that one of the major symptoms we see is lots and lots of fatigue. And so I always use that little cheat uh, um, in clinic. If somebody's hematic crit or blood count has slowly been drifting down and they say, you know, the worst problem I'm having is the severe fatigue. It's the first thing I think of. And you can go in for the endoscopy and they can go and, and um, laser coag or take care of those. And it's, it's really, um, it works pretty quickly in as far as restoring some of that energy level. So um, moving on to the small bowel, um, dysmotility we've discussed, and so that poorly contract, those poorly coordinated contractions that also occur in the, the esophagus can occur in the small bowel. That when your gut doesn't work really well, bad bacteria like that niche. So good bacteria um, are absolutely essential for our proper gastrointestinal functioning. When the gut's sick, that bad bacteria says, ooh, I, I like this, and can overgrow and cause quite a bit of symptomatology with diarrhea, bloating, nausea, and cramps. When bacteria moves from the inside of the gut, which we call the lumen, into the wall of the gut, can make gas along the side of the bowel wall, and we call that pneumatosis intestinalis, and that can be very severe, causing quite a bit of pain, and does require abdominal imaging to, to diagnose. Lastly, anus can involve the sphincter. And I'm sorry if I'm standing right in the way, I'm gonna move a little, because I see you have people trying to stretch around me. Um, so the sphincter can be involved, which leads to fecal incontinence, and that can be diagnosed with rectal manometry. So before, I, like I said, really wordy slide, the most wordy slide I promise on the presentation, but I just really highlight some sort of non-specific symptoms for lots of different potential problems. And that's frustrating as a patient um, because you really don't want to do all those tests to be able to move forward. And so um, one of the ways, oh, please. On the, for the breath test, the I'm going to go over it. So great question. Yeah, I, in each of the studies now I'll go over and show you what they look like. I just wanted to have you have sort of an overview on that. And so one of the ways to best understand the appropriateness of further studies in the clinic are questionnaires. And so I just, this is, you can barely see, but this is the one I use every clinic visit. It's the UCLA GI Track 2.0. Dr. Khanna, who's gonna be speaking after me, developed this questionnaire, and I have found it to be a fabulous tool to use in the clinic. Even better yet, if you Google that, you can fill the questionnaire out for yourself. So if your doctor's not using it, you can become in charge or empowered of your GI symptoms because you can decide whether things are mild or severe. And I think these questionnaires 
really help us treat symptoms. Because sometimes the hardest part of scleroderma, I believe, is is this my scleroderma or is this just I ate bad food? Or did I get what my grandchild had? And so trying, you can track it over time to be able to understand if this is a, a symptom that's present consistently and, it, and its severity. And it's nice, it breaks it down by reflex, distension, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, fecal soilage, emotional well-being, social functioning for total scores. And it comes out calculated at the end and gives you like a red bar, a yellow bar, or a green bar to know how severe your symptoms are at each of those domains. So I find that an extraordinarily helpful question. It's 34 questions. Um, I, I occasionally have patients complain in clinic. I say, oh, this question you're again. Um, but, but I do find it to, to help guide the appropriateness of invasive studies. I also point out that there's lots of other questionnaires out there, and I, I, um, I think Dr. Connor may touch on some of these in the next talk, um, but reflux questionnaires, gastroparesis measures, bacterial overgrowth, constipation and fecal incontinence, all of these very specific symptom, um, symptom um, recording can help us understand when we try something is it helping you? And that's the key because everyone's GI tract is so different that the answer is probably not going to be in a huge randomized placebo control trial. I like to think of the patient as their own trial. So to give you the power to track how your symptoms are doing and if the intervention is making a difference, and I believe that. I don't care if the big trial says it didn't work. For your gut, if you find a diet that works, let's keep it there. And so that, these, these are really excellent tools to move forward. So why is it so complex? And why did I just say, I don't care what the biggest, largest randomized control trial shows? Because there's so many variables that we can't control for. And so I really, in all my images, they are not referenced, they're off Google images. So I, I, this one I loved because it talks about, is it a trigger that's causing the intestinal problem? So I point that out because they misspelled intestinal. I couldn't change it. <laughs> so is it a dietary protein that doesn't, doesn't work for you? Is it because we've overdone our acid suppression or under sub acid suppressed? Because believe it or not, a lot of the enzymes that work in our gut require certain levels of acid to activate. So are we, are we changing acid for good or bad? Are you taking antibiotics? How does that affect intestinal damage? Do you have a concurrent infection? Blood sugar issues can slow the gut. So is it two issues rather than just the scleroderma working? And those, anti, those pesky autoantibodies, we know they help us diagnose scleroderma, but we actually don't know really what they mean. So are they playing a role in this gut dysfunction? Furthermore, to complicate it, pregnancy, stress, menopause, certain environmental toxins and food allergies all can play a role in how well your gut works. And I point out here, this is a nice intestinal mucose cells. I, say, I always say we're really smartly designed because the gut looks like little fingers. And that increases the surface area, so lots of nutrients can get absorbed. But like a finger, these have little blood vessels in it. So in the same way you have renodes of your fingers, you could have renodes of your gut lining cells, except they're not, we don't see it. So we don't understand its severity in the GI tract. And so you can see you have a nice looking tight connections. These cells are doing great. They're absorbing all the nutrients. Uh-oh, here's one that's not very happy. And when it's leaky and inflamed, Toxins and inflammation can get into your bloodstream, and really inflammation or malabsorption, immune dysfunction, really being driven by the gut is a very real possibility in scleroderma, but really challenging to study. So if we can modify any of these in the individual, that has great potential for making you feel better. But if it's dietary proteins in one person and uh, um, an infection in another, that, that's a very different approach. And so again, using your questionnaires to know where your gut is at becomes an essential part of management. Here is the challenge to your physician. This is how we examine your gut. That's not really as the level of detail that we would like to be able to move forward with your treatment. And so we, you know, we feel and we say, okay, there's no masses, are you tender? Uh, even if you say you're tender, they may shake your hip or slap your heel and maybe say, oh, it's not really that acute. Okay, well, and then you don't get your answer. And I say this because that was one of the reasons I have an interest in this is that frustrated me as a physician. Here someone's coming to me, wants to feel better, and I have my exam that doesn't really help me. 
The real issue with scleroderma too is if this is, if we're looking at a, the gut, here's the lumen, so food would pass through this tube. All those fancy little cells with fingers sit right here. But all the complexity of the structure, so we start by saying it's a vasculopathy. So blood vessels go through all the gut wall up to those little fingers. How do we best understand vasculopathy in this very complex system? When we're doing a scope and we're going through there, we're not even, and we're taking tiny tissue biopsies, we're not really looking at the blood vessels in the, in the larger and smaller blood um, uh, uh, parts of the, of the tissue. So this is a challenge for us to, to understand how to fix the gut. Now with that, I am gonna now go on to those procedures. So I said this is what, these are the, the tools we have in our tool belt to, to uh, best understand that. The scleroderma esophagus, oftentimes we use the term patulous, which means the innervation here, which comprises the lower esophageal sphincter, is just wide open. So if you think about it, it looks like a, a PVC pipe that just doesn't have a nice tight ending on the end. An abnormal um, acid can get up into the esophagus and cause ulcers to the base of it. You can, if, like you asked the great question about, you know, appropriate of endoscopy. If you're on suppression of your immune system, bad bacteria and other types of, of um, opportunistic infections like fungus can overgrow in the base of the esophagus. And there's an increase of, of Barrett's, which is a precancerous lesion, after many years of acid exposure as well as um, of actual cancer. So precancers and cancer lesions, if there's lots of reflux over time. And so what can be done is that endoscopist, a gastroenterologist takes an endoscope and puts this, this um, scope down through the mouth into the esophagus and takes a look at the stomach and the small bowel. And they can also get access to tissues and oftentimes, and I have all my patients um, who are willing to allow me to study routine biopsies for specimens. So we actually look at the biopsies to see if we can get some signal about what's going on in the cellular level. So the, this is an upper endoscopy procedure that can take about five to 10 minutes and again is indicated for the reasons that we discussed. Sometimes your physician prior to an endoscopy will recommend a barium swallow. And so, yes, and I actually you may say, well, I thought this was going to be on nutrition and probiotics, but this is the point. When do we add, when do we go to these invasive procedures and when can we just go ahead and treat empirically? And the answer is coming because I, I, I fear, I see, I see eyes out there going, oh, no, not this again. Um, the nutrition part's coming. <laughs> but the reason is important is nutrition can't fix these. So if you have a stricture or a hiatal hernia, oftentimes I, people will give up on a diet or give up on trying something, a healthy lifestyle because they say, oh, it didn't work. And just make sure before we say something doesn't work, let's make sure there's not anything going on. And one of the studies where you swallow a, sw a solution of barium can look at structural problems. And just really one out of three people that have reflux um, um, have these esophageal changes that are visible. And so there may be an indication for, again, if you're filling out your questionnaires, you're trying something, it's not working, going to the procedures at that point may be very instructive. Let's talk a little bit about reflux because I think this is a really hot area. We used to say, and I'll say even five years ago, um, we used to say, you have scleroderma, you're going to have reflux, take a proton pump inhibitor twice a day. And then all that stuff started coming out about gastric polyps and vitamin D malabsorption. And maybe if we suppress the acid too low, bacterial overgrowth can occur. And so I really think we need to rethink this. And this is again where that questionnaire is really helpful. So if I have a patient come into clinic and they have zero symptoms of reflux, even if they're a new scleroderma patient, I will not start a proton pump inhibitor. It should be driven by symptomatology. And that's why when I say possible gastroesophageal reflux symptoms, I, um, I think that you really have to be clear that there's symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux and those questionnaires help really fine tune that. Then there's usually a trial of a proton pump inhibitor, that's your omeprazole, um, your Prilosec, your pantoprazole, Nexium. Those medications can be tried, and actually it's considered, if they work, then it was probably reflux, and that, and you're in a good place. 
If your symptoms are pers uh, persistent, that's really where the studies start to be helpful. Because again, we don't want to do harm here. So if you're having symptoms despite acid suppression, I don't think the answer is, well, you have scleroderma and esophagus is involved. I think it's, let's figure out why this is not working. And that's really where you can talk to your doctor and request to, to be referred to gastroenterology. And one of the reasons I really have this interest is I would get so frustrated when I refer to a patient and I get the report back from the gastroenterologist and it say, um, patient has scleroderma, so they have reflux. I said, no, that's not what I was asking you. I was asking you what studies we can do next. And so now I really found I have to tell my gastroenterologist exactly what I want. So that's why I'm giving you these slide sets so you have that background knowledge when it's appropriate. And again, this is, this is just for your, you, there's lots of information on here. I know you can't see in the back, but it's on your, when you get the slide set, you'll be able to have this to, to refer to when you talk to your physician. And then pedants, again, they're just looking to see if you're having acid reflux, is it acidic or are we acid suppressing you? Um, and where to the level of in the esophagus is that reflux occurring? So behavioral interventions for reflux is what I really want to highlight, because that's really what my passion is. So nutrition, probiotics, things you can do, tools in your toolbox that can prevent you from having to go do those studies. So the first is avoidance of tobacco, alcohol, and post-meal times. So uh, post-meal mints, sorry, um, after your meal. So mints are designed to have you, to open the lower esophageal sphincter so you burp, and then you're hungry for dessert. So that was sort of the history of, of dinner mints. So, and I point that out because people love spearmint mouthwashes and toothpaste, um, but theoretically that is probably best to avoid anything with mint because it does relax the esophageal sphincter. Weight loss, um, it can oftentimes be helpful, but I'm really cautious with weight loss. So I think uh, doing this in a, in, a, in a safe manner is important. When we talk about nutrition in the next couple of slides, I'll explain how I think that should go about. I don't like crash diets. I don't like people trying to take diuretics to get fluid off. I think a very slow, methodical goal for eating healthy is, is the best. So in tight-fitting garments to prevent that increased gastric pressure, which is why I should have had a belt on so I could be all set with this, but I, I follow my own advice. And again, if you put a belt on really tight, it compresses against the stomach, and if your esophagus is not working really well, reflux. So dress comfortably, you know, that's, that's one of the, the keys for prevention. Elevation of the head of bed with, if you have a lot of nocturnal symptoms. And this can be particularly tricky in scleroderma because you may have a cough. And so cough is a kind of nonspecific symptom. And you may not even realize it, but it's not interstitial lung disease getting worse, but it's reflux or heartburn. You have cough receptors in the base of your esophagus that when acid hits them, it can make you cough. So putting a six to, a six to eight inch block at the, at the head of the bed, so your bed is elevated, can be very effective. Some people ask, well, what about just a bunch of pillows? That actually can increase the gastric pressure, so it's better to have it uniformly underneath the, the bed. You can also um, try to really limit what you're eating two to three hours before bedtime. And that, that is a behavioral intervention I have found that's had huge success in my patient population. Raise your hand if, if you feel comfortable. Who is doing these, these measures? Good, so that that's, that that's really makes me feel um, uh, encouraged that good information's out there. Because I'd much prefer to do this then refer a patient off for a barium swallow. So I really think that doing these little things, if you notice a clearing of a reflux, or even more importantly, if some of this is working and you don't need your proton pump inhibitor every day, that's good news too. And then that's really the next point is, Ensure your proper dosing of your proton pump inhibitor. So don't do the blanket twice a day. Work with your physician to find the right dose for you and use your questionnaires to be able to know whether that is working. And then um, the other thing, 30 minutes before the meal. So this is another, I was so embarrassed. I, when I first started, I wasn't telling patients how to take their proton pump inhibitor. It's very, they can't work unless you take them pre-meal. So oftentimes, a patient would think, oh, well, I ate my meal, oh, I have some reflux, I better take my proton pump inhibitor. So really being educated and knowing the proper dosing is important. All right, small bacterial overgrowth. The question about um, uh, bacterial um, testing is on the very next slide. But first, let's just talk a little bit about all the different bacteria that live with us. 
So we're actually more bacterial than human. So we carry more bacteria cells around than human cells. I know that's kind of hard to believe. And there's lots of different forms that live in the mouth, in the duodenum, which is the top part of the small bowel, the stomach, the, and uh, um, throughout the intestines and colon. And so we carry all this bacteria around, and we talked a little bit about maybe root nodes of the gut can shift bacterial populations. Um, and we, I did a small study that tried to look at um, are there certain bacterial populations that are present um, in our patient population um, in, in scleroderma patients as opposed to healthy controls. And I personally at our center, we did um, about 30 patients and we didn't see a signature. But recently at ULAR, which is the European meeting for rheumatologists, there was a study out of UCLA that did find a more inflammatory population in their scleroderma population. So that's only in an abstract form, it hasn't been published, and again, I didn't find it in my own um, population, but I think that adds an interest to all of us to better understand what are these populations and how can we use our good bacteria to work for us. Now one of the things that can be done to see if you have too much bad bacteria is, is um, the, a breath test. So a breath test, will, will you take a test sugar, it gets metabolized or fermented that, that goes into the bloodstream and then you breathe it out and it, and it measures to see if you have an early peak in, heart, um, in hydrogen. So it can look to see if bacteria is changing that fermentable sugar and you're breathing it out. Alternatively, if you're going for an upper endoscopy, they can go into the small bowel and take some fluid culture and look to see if there's bad bacteria present. But these are both pretty invasive, so what I kind of like is just behavioral interventions first. And I'll tell you, by, this has probably been my best first patient new visit that I've, that um, Pearl. So I usually spend quite a bit of time talking about things we could potentially do to make the gut better. Because if patients feel better that second visit, um, then I feel like we can delve into some other issues. But the gut is really that, and I know you're at this talk, but is that miserable part of this that I feel that if there's a little bit of tools in your toolbox to make it better, maybe we can um, do some prevention as well. And so first we'll go through your drug list. And it's hard because joints hurt and muscles hurt and narcotics oftentimes are a cornerstone to pain management. But your doctor, if they're prescribing you narcotics, should always be talking to you about a bowel regimen. So are we making you constipated on the medications we're giving you for another reason? And if you are constipated, what medications can we add to help move things along? And um, in case of the sluggish motility, um, where you just feel bloated, you're not, you're not emptying your bowels very well, medications that move the bowels can work very well. But this is, again, there's no magic dose for this. So it's going to be a personalized approach. It may be that your doctor adds a medication called domperidone, which gets the bowel moving, but you do better on two times a day dosing rather than three times a day dosing. That's fine. Just make sure that you're tracking your symptoms and figuring out when you need your promotility. And furthermore, is it, it's, I never say, take this every day and then come back. We, these are tools in your toolbox. You may need domperidone some of the time. Bowels get going, you stop it. And so using these medications that um, when they're needed can be extremely helpful. Antibiotic therapy can reduce. So this is another point I like to make, is we want to reduce rather than eradicate the bacteria in your gut. And so why is that so important is if you get a pneumonia and you're treated for that pneumonia, you may say, oh my goodness, this gut is worse than the pneumonia was. And it's because we maybe overdid it and that's a real role for us to understand the bacterial flora and how to repopulate that. And then dietary manipulation, which we'll spend the next part talking about, may also help that gut. So a sick gut with bad bacteria doesn't like certain food types. So the primary goal of our, of our diet is to get you nutrients that are readily absorbed in, through that lumen into the bloodstream, leaving fewer calories for that bad bacteria. So we want to make your gut's job easy. So we should really reduce non-absorbable carbohydrates. High fat, low carbohydrate, low fiber diets may be helpful. And I, I should have changed is to may because again, personalized approach. And your questionnaires will tell you whether that's working or not. 
Why do I say fat? Because fat is not significantly metabolized by the bacteria. Our bad bacteria doesn't really like that fat as much, and so that can be helpful. And again, that's why I really am cautious to ever say weight loss is good, because actually it depends on where your gut is at and how it's working. It, fats are good calorie source, um, uh, source for those who are even re, re, uh, receiving supplemental nutrition, such as tube feeds or, or IV nutrition. Fat can sometimes help in low amounts keep the gut um, functioning. So what about this low FODMAP diet? This, um, I love the low FODMAP diet. Um, I think it's a great um, uh, place to start if you have um, lots of different gastrointestinal symptoms and you're not sure what part of the gut it's coming from. The best way to get at this, and you'll get the handout, but if you Google FODMAP and Stanford, I like their handout the best. And I, you know, I love the Scleroderma Foundation handout, I should say that. That's a real thick, it goes into really a lot of the detail. But that four page cheat sheet basically tells you first what a FODMAP is, and then tells you what, what foods have uh, lots of FODMAPs, which you should avoid, and that have low FODMAPs that are good. The next one gives you tips and serving sizes, which I love because there's nothing more annoying than saying, you should limit almonds. What does that mean, limit? Is that five? Is that 25? So it gives you actual <laughs> serving sizes, which I think is very helpful. And then the last gives you snack ideas and references. So in four pages, I give that out at my first visit every time and say, try it. This is not gospel. It is not to make your, this is not supposed to make your life miserable. So it's not supposed to take away all those good, bless you, all those good foods away that you enjoyed. But it is a place to start to see if there is a nutritional aspect to your symptoms. It also, I point out that, that um, FODMAPs um, are basically fructose, lactose, fructans, galactans, and polyols. But let me point out um, that there's certain things that are pretty easy for us to um, avoid. So high fructose uh, corn syrup, unfortunately, I mean, it's in the lay press, we know it's bad, but it is in everything. So get in the habit of turning over your Gatorade. You're feeling sick. What's the first thing someone's going to bring you? A Gatorade full of high fructose uh, corn syrup. So it's really unfortunate. Apples are actually high in FODMAPs. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. You know, all these things that are go-to foods may have things that a sick gut doesn't really like. And so I like the FODMAP as a place to start when you're feeling sick. You're feeling a little off. That's the time to kind of go back to this and say, maybe I can manipulate my diet a bit to get it nutrition that a sick gut likes. Um, the goal is to get adequate nutrition and minimal symptoms. So again, this is not to make your life miserable. I don't want you to take this home and be like, oh, she took away everything I love. But instead to say, oh, I'm not feeling good today. This is a good resource for me to, to use and know. So why is it so important for us to understand malnutrition? Is it's really common. And this is I, one of my biggest pet peeves is when a patient comes in overweight and a doctor has told them to lose weight. And, and, and they're eating next to nothing. And that's and they, they're really, their nutrition is really poor and they're actually malnourished. And we shouldn't be saying lose weight, we should be saying, you're malnourished, let's meet with a nutritionist, let's figure out how to get you good, good molecules into your body so you can absorb them so you feel better. And this is just to point out that really in our population, we did a, a, a look at studies of patients and just random assortment of patients came in and did some um, very extensive malnutrition and found it in a quarter of our patient population. Um, and the next slide shows you, it's super busy and it's, and it's only to show you how hard I work. No, it's to show you, we really looked at these patients. We really, really looked at these patients. And what we found is GI tract symptoms were across levels of nutritional status and diets. And so patients, here I am, every visit I'm passing out the low FODMAP diet. I you know, basically ask them and follow up, what are you doing? What special kind of diets? And then you'll see some people say, well, FODMAP, I didn't really need it. Um, I'm limiting gluten, I feel good on that. Or I try to just watch my sugars, I feel good on that. But really the key is even if you have filled out your questionnaire diligently, if your gut is feeling sick, I think it's worth going to a nutritionist, who is my colleague, um, Dr. Murtaugh here, to meet with you and to go over to make sure you're not missing essential things like zinc or something that might be helpful for healing. And so I really use uh, a nutritional referral. Um, and you, and I had, haven't had problems with my insurance companies either as long as I write the letter and say that it's indicated for medical help. 
The other thing just to be aware of is that oftentimes scleroderma comes with some other different diseases. And so Sjogren's, which is the dry eye, dry mouth condition, can cause parotid gland swelling or lymph node swelling and lots of dryness of the mouth. And so drinking water before you eat or using some of those artificial salivas can be very helpful for making sure you're getting adequate nutrition. There's nothing worse than sitting down and having such a dry mouth you just you lose your appetite. So trying to, on the front end, combat some of those symptoms to get adequate nutrition is important. Celiac disease is gluten insensitivity, but um, the key here is that lots of patients feel better gluten-free. So even if you've been tested and you've had your scope and they looked and they say, we don't see evidence of celiac and they send the blood test and you don't have celiac, but you feel better gluten-free, go gluten-free. So that's really that, that personalized approach. If you feel better eliminating gluten out of your diet, then, then, then that's something you should consider. By the same token, please. No, if you feel, so there's a difference between, so the reason I wrote celiac disease rather than gluten sensitivity, some people are sensitive to it, and so they can limit the amount of gluten, and they kind of know how much they can cheat. With celiac disease, you actually have, you do have to limit all the gluten because there can be risks of small bowel lymphoma. And so there's a difference between gluten insensitivity and celiac disease. But I point out, because actually there was a study that didn't show a, um, that there was a higher incidence of celiac disease in the scleroderma patient population, and that was kind of shocking. I think there's gluten insensitivity all the way to the disease is probably a spectrum. And so I do, I, I do think that I've had enough patients that have gone to gastroenterologists and said, well, you've been tested, you can eat gluten. And they come back and they're like, Tracy, I just feel better gluten-free. And I said, do it. You, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to have that diagnosis to go gluten-free, please. But if you go gluten-free and then get tested? Then it'll be negative. Yeah, it'll be negative. Exactly. So that's a great point. So you have to be on gluten to be tested. And, um, and that comes with a blood test, too. So you're, 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 it's not just the scope, it's the blood test. So you have to be eating gluten to be tested. Nice, nice point, thank you. What about eosinophilic esophagitis? Dr. York did a nice job talking about eosinophils in the last um, lecture. These are cells that, that really get upregulated for allergy. Um, Eosinophilic esophagitis is where these cells are all along the base of the esophagus. We've done some studies, this will be coming out soon, looking that there's actually a higher incidence of, of eosinophilic esophagitis in families of patients with scleroderma, so maybe some food allergy um, heritability associations that we're exploring. This is only diagnosed by endoscopy. So this is one of those things where you, your question was great, is when, when should I be scoped? Do we wait 10 years if you're having a reflux? Go ahead, please. Could you please just quickly repeat that? You said yep, absolutely. The EOE, or eosinophilic esophagitis, is where there are greater than... found that oh, sorry. there was higher prevalence in families with scleroderma? Exactly. So we have something called a Utah population database, which goes back to the 1840s. It was um, based, actually based originally on the um, LDS church, who took these molecular, these just remarkable records of health histories in patients. And so if someone comes to the hospital in Utah, they get plugged into the Utah Population Database, and we can look at comparable heritability. So we can look at a diagnosis in these huge family pedigrees. And then you just type in all these different diagnoses. And I was really interested in this patulous esophagus. What does that mean, and why is it so common? And we found a lot more of this eosinophilic esophagitis in families of patients with scleroderma. And so it's a localized fibrotic inflammatory lesion of the esophagus due to food allergy. So what does that mean? You know, how can you use that? Um, how can you use that practically speaking? If you feel as if you have food intolerances, and that's really where I'm empowering you, you get your GI tract questionnaire out, you certain foods don't work, or you can't really figure out lots of foods don't work. Being tested for food allergy may have a role, which is the conclusion of, this, of, the, of the paper that we have in process, is it may be reasonable to meet with an allergist and be tested you know, sort of extensively for, for allergens. Because we really want to understand why your gut's not working and what the right nutrition is. Um, and then inflammatory bowel disease, that's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, those are inflammatory lesions. And again, back to that probiotic um, abstract, is the populations of bad bacteria in scleroderma patients actually look somewhat similar to the inflammatory bowel disease population. So just this slide is to point out, 
If you're having symptoms that are not getting better, you're doing all the things in your power to try to make it feel better, thinking to make sure that there's not another condition is certainly reasonable. And then this is what I think is fascinating. So I, you know, if you think about the treatments we give for, um, for interstitial lung disease, so these, we suppress your immune system. For pulmonary arterial hypertension, we increase blood flow. For skin um, involvement, we suppress your immune system. And for digital ulcers, we oftentimes dilate your, your uh, um, blood vessels. How does that affect those little fingers of the gut? So we're giving you more blood flow. What do the bacteria think about that? We're suppressing the immune system. What do the good bacteria think about that? So we really don't understand the effects of these gastrointestinal symptoms. And as you know, and many of you have participated in clinical trials, how often are you giving GI tract biopsies during those trials? No, never. So we really do, um, I, what I really rely on my patients to tell me how they're doing. That's why I fill that questionnaire out every time, is if I've started a disease uh, a modifier for skin, but I'm seeing my GI tract questionnaire get worse, I really have to pause there and try to understand how to get us back into uh, the green zone. And so again, this is just to, to put a pitch out again for you to track your symptoms on that GI tract questionnaire. You start a new therapy, understand what it's doing for, for your gut, and maybe it'll make it better. I've had patients get on medications for pulmonary arterial hypertension, it improves the blood flow to their gut, and they actually feel as if they can eat more types of food. So there is, I, I try not to think of the gut as a big black box, but instead as a signal of how overall we're doing. So what is dysbiosis? Again, a slide with way too many words, but this was your cheat sheet so that you could uh, look at it later. So again, we've touched on this first point that the body um, is full of bacteria in the gut, and this, these guts, the uh, bacteria in our gut live in symbiosis or help keep us in balance. And so any changes to that good bacteria can affect our immunity and how the gut works. And so environmental, nutritional, gut-derived triggers that can perturb that microbiome, so, so really getting an influence of a, any substance into the gut that def, influences the gut barrier can, is a problem. So, we, so dysbiosis is bacteria is not what is not in its optimal amount of balance with self. And really, um, I, you know, I really highlight this again because a change in composition of the GI tract biofilm in response to when we're giving these medications are not known. And so you may find, and I, I tell patients this all the time, is they, they'll, they have to shift their diet as they change therapy. So certain foods that they've, t they've tolerated for years, which was their go-to food, and I know you all know that, when you're having a sick day, you know what you, what you go to. And all of a sudden, you're taking something new and your go-to food is no longer working. And that's really, there's that moment of panic. But oftentimes trying to experiment with some of those other options on the FODMAP can help. And it just probably is we've changed that, that homeostasis. So we, rest, we can restore GI balance with probiotics, which are live bacteria that are good for your health and your digestion system. They're called good or helpful bacteria. And when they're administered in adequate amounts, we think there's some improvement. And I only have my five minute warning, so I only think I have like three more slides left. But I'll tell you just a, a really cute little story on this. Is I had a patient who started a probiotic and she came back to me, I loved her. She said, Tracy, this is better than any treatment you've ever given me. And, I, and it was one of those things she was leaving, I was like, well, I guess you could try a line. I, you know, I didn't know. And she, her questionnaire came back and it was so much better. And I was like, that's really curious. So I gave it to the next 10 patients that I was seeing in clinic and every GI tract questionnaire improved. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is really important. So what I should have done is at that point, organize a big randomized placebo control trial. But I was so excited that I wanna get the information out there that I published on 10 patients, just so that people knew that, that there is this potential. Um, important thing we can try. And so the question I oftentimes get at this point, what probiotic? I did a line, which is bifidiobacterium, because when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, that's a good small bacterial. I'm trying to move bloating to the right spectrum. So um, in that study, I looked at uh, line and culturel because they were over the counter and patients were paying for them. Um, but I do not, because I'm gonna get lots of hands, I know what, sh what is the right one, what about this brand, we don't know. I tried then subsequently to do the clinical trial 
um, and no pharmaceutical company was really interested um, because they're not FDA regulated. They're like, I don't really think I really, I, we're a food product, we're just food. So we're not really keen on being studied in that man manner when I approached about the study. So I know that that's the million dollar, you all came to the probiotic talk to hear what's the right probiotic. And the answer is we don't know. But um, I, I do tell patients you can try different ones to see and usually a month is a reasonable duration of therapy before you switch. Um, just three more words on different things of restoring the um, GI tract balance. Prebiotics are things people try, please. I know you don't necessarily want to recommend a particular probiotic, but I thought probiotics were something that was behind. Yes, unfortunately though, there was some, when they looked at the biopsies, there was maybe some inflammation there. So Culturel did fall a little bit out of favor for the IBD literature. The other thing people always ask if they have primary biliary cirrhosis, there was VSL number three has been looked at for liver fibrosis. And those patients are, are um, for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver and that had some antifibrotic effects. So VSL number three seems like maybe it'd be a good one. Again, what I say, go cheap. So don't, you know, we, since we don't have the answers, don't wreck your pocketbook on this. Um, you feel free to try some different things. But if you are shifting probiotics, keep your diet pretty steady. So I always say first start with the diet, figure out where you're at with your nutrition, then consider the probiotic. And when you're doing the probiotic, um, try to get a cheaper version. Again, I used, I used a line and I had, you know, for my patients, that's usually what I recommend because it seems to work. I have no funding or anything from, from that company. Please. Um, do you recommend the liquid or the we don't know um, the answer to that question. If someone has had strictures, I prefer the liquid. Um, and, um, but again, cost is a big thing. I, you know, when I look at, I always ask patients, how much does this cost? And there's like the latest and greatest on the internet and it's so expensive. And I say, there's just no data to support that, that cost. You're welcome. Um, rifaximin is a non-absorbable antibiotic for bacterial overgrowth. I love it. Um, it's really hard to get because it's expensive. Um, but it is kind of of interest, and I'm just pointing it out because oftentimes your physicians haven't thought of it. So if you've tried lots of different auto or, or antibiotics for your small bacterial overgrowth and you feel worse, this is one that has no GI tract um, side effects. So it's one that's if you're having a sick gut anyways, it's reasonable to discuss with your physician. Please. Is that the same as Zymaxin? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Sorry. I'm supposed to like not use like uh, trade names, so though I, I slip up sometimes. Um, but it's, it's really interesting because it has lots of potential mechanisms, which I won't go into because I know I got my five-minute warning. And then fecal transplant, I had to say a word about this because um, you can't go to a dysbiosis lecture and not mention this. Um, so C. difficile, uh, Clostridium difficile, is an overgrowth um, that can occur after antibiotic therapies. And this can be absolutely a devastating infection. And one of the things that revolutionized the field of gastroenterology is the um, idea of taking stool from a healthy person and introducing it by enema or endoscopy into someone with C. diff. And it actually made patients miraculously get better. So I have been very keen on doing this for my patients that, that um, you know, suffer from really end-stage GI tract disease. But it's really hard to get it approved because it's pretty experimental. The good news, and the only reason I put this in, lots of companies are developing drugs that took those good bacteria and make it more palatable. So you would take a pill as opposed to having your spouse's stool put up it through an enema. So, and I apologize, someone at breakfast I started talking this about and I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't talk about this at breakfast. So whoever was out there, I apologize in advance. So in summary, I'm probably a little bit over, but we started five minutes late, so I, I had timed myself perfectly. Um, GI tract symptoms are common, but just because they're common, do not take, oh, you have scleroderma as an answer. You have scleroderma, you have GI tract involvement, we need to do our best job to make it better. Also, use your questionnaires, I love it. You know, you can bring it to clinic and say, I've been tracking my GI tract questionnaire, here's once a week. We started this drug and I'm doing worse, so what should we do about that? So that gives you a little bit of power tools in your tool belt to use. 
diagnostic studies do have a role if you failed empiric therapy. So we've gone through the studies just so you know what to ask about when nutrition and probiotics don't make a difference. However, I'm a firm believer that dietary interventions and understanding dysbiosis or how bacteria live in harmony with us play a major role in helping our scleroderma patients. And remember, discuss your nutritional concerns with your physician and a referral to a nutritionist or an allergist if you think it's right for you. It may not be right for you. You may try low FODMAP, try probiotic, and you're in the mild zone. And that's lots of my patient population. But if you are just not getting better, I absolutely use procedures and referrals to help guide us in the right direction. And with that, I conclude. I think the Scleroderma Foundation, amazing group of folks, um, my patients who I believe are such an honor to take care of um, and motivate me to write grants after hours because I really do want to find a cure for this disease. This, this is the uh, care team I work with, all the smart people that run all those really difficult experiments and look at stool and um, all the funding sources that have been kind enough to give me money to, to hopefully um, work towards the goal of a cure. So